showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to Night Fright. I'm excited tonight, folks. Tonight is our Halloween show. Settle in, get cozy, folks. We're going to have a bunch of fun tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about zombies, of all things, all night. The undead. Don't be scared. It's only radio. It's only television. We're going to be looking at a new book by Bat Moak. Uh, the book is called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know about zombies and we know from experience we get the emails folks that you want to know a lot about zombies stick around folks this is going to be a fun show for halloween happy halloween everybody strap in hang on here we go there is a time to question there is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, folks. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. I'm excited, folks, because tonight is our Halloween show. Happy Halloween to one and all. We're going to be looking at zombies tonight. Ooh, the undead, as they say. Uh, we're going to be looking at the various aspects of zombies, the whole culture that has popped up around zombies. Uh, none better. Our guest tonight is Matt Moak. He is the leading global authority on all things zombie. I'm just going to pick this up so it's closer and put my glasses on because I hate getting old, but this is one of those things I have to do now. Uh, as founder and the head of the Zombie Research Society, ZRS, ZRS, <laughs> he has been directly involved in most advances in zombie scholarship over the past decade. He's earned a master's degree from New York University Film School. Ah, we're going to talk about that. Uh, where he specialized in horror in cinema. Matt was awarded a Sloan Foundation National Fellowship for Science and Screenwriting. He then received advanced combat and survival training. Where did you hear this? In the French Foreign Legion. Ah, we said, c'est ça, mon amour, mes amis. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Absolument pas de problème. The mercenary wing of the French military. Let's get to Matt right away. The book is called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome, my friend. Let's start off right away. You know, I did research last night, folks. This is what I love about this show. Doing research required me to watch Night of the Living Dead for the millionth time. George Romero's classic. Black and white, of course. Uh, I like the original the best, although the remake is fun, too. And we're going to talk about all those horror films as well. But, you know, halfway through it, Matt, I was asking myself, why have I watched this movie a million times? And why? I know the outcome. I know the ending. I know what's going to happen. I'm saying the words uh, as they're saying them themselves, like, uh, they're coming to get you, Barbara. And why has this phenomena taken off? And why am I watching this show over and over and over again? Over yeah, I mean, it's, you know, first what I can say is that Night of the Living Dead uh, completely, it, it created the modern zombie. I mean, you pick the right movie to watch, right? Because before Night of the Living Dead in 1968, uh, no one had ever imagined this notion of a, mo of a creature that would rise, these corpses that would rise and eat living people. I mean, zombies weren't weren't that. They were these soulless slaves, and that worked in fields in Haiti, and they were, weren't dangerous, and they didn't eat people. So, when Night of the Living Dead came out in 1968, I mean, it was completely shocking. It terrified people, freaked people out. Uh, you know, everyone from Stephen King saying it turned him to jelly when he was a junior in high school, to Roger Ebert talking about uh, the little kids that were watching him in the theater with him. Because back then, horror movies were like matinees. You'd go to the Sunday matinee, and you'd see, you know. The Blob or some sort of mildly suspenseful story 
um, Night of the Living Dead was the first modern horror movie that was really like terrifying. You, know, you saw people eating each other, you saw the blood and guts and corpses, and so it was, it was a whole new level of horror movie. I think that's why it sort of stuck around. You know, and I have to mention, bringing it up full to uh, present day, AMC's got a... AMC, folks, for those of you that aren't aware, is a, a television network. They have a series on called The Walking Dead, which is ph phenomenal. It's all about zombies and uh, modern day. Uh, this poor fellow wakes up in a hospital. Next thing you know, um, his family has disappeared. And the scenario is amazing. Now, again, this cultural phenomena. Why are we attracted to zombies? Um, you know, these are the guys that go around and eat you, for goodness sake. <laughs> uh, I know. It's, it's, you know, there are a lot of theories out there. What I really think is that zombies are the first uh, modern monster, meaning that they're really, they're not based in some ancient superstition or myth. You look at like vampires and werewolves. These are traditions that were passed down over centuries. Zombies are purely modern. So they're sort of biologically based. They don't have any supernatural, superhuman abilities. They don't fly. They don't climb on the ceilings. They're quite literally rotting forces that stand up and start walking around. So they kind of make sense in our modern understanding of the world. There's no romance in a zombie. It's not, you know, it's not a mystery. They're right in your face. And that's kind of the way we understand the world now. Also, if you think about uh, just our, our understanding of microbiology and bacteria and, and how diseases spread, it, in the start of World War II, the top virologists on the planet didn't really, they didn't have electron microscopes, they didn't really understand how the flu spread from one person to another. Now, you ask any common person walking down the street, you know, how you catch sexually transmitted diseases, how the flu is spread, all that stuff. We have so much understanding of microbiology that that really plays into the zombie too. Because you get bitten by a zombie, you turn into a zombie, right? Just like a lot of other diseases. Settle in, folks. You're just joining us. Lots and lots of time left. We're having a blast tonight. It's our Halloween, our annual Halloween show, and none better. We're talking about zombies. Uh, none better for a guest tonight than Matt Mo. Uh, the book is called Everything You Wanted to Know About Zombies. He's got another book out that's called That's Not Your Mommy Anymore. And I laugh because... I guess that's part of the cultural thing too, Matt. Um, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the book cover associated with tonight's guest. That'll take you right to a place where you can order this book from the comfort of your own home. Blustery night out there, folks. It's Halloween. Settle in. Um, we're talking about zombies the whole night long, and this is a great book for you to get. Now, I guess that's part of it too. I laugh. Um, now, we, you have a film background as well. And we know that film in general is it's an art form, of course. It represents what's going on in society at the time. And I was thinking about those aspects too as I watched George Romero's um, uh, classic Night of the Living Dead. You know, it was 67, I believe. So what's going on then, folks? We were right there, the Kennedy assassination's taken place. Uh, we're in the middle of the Cold War. Zombies perhaps are Soviet robots. Can is that too far fetched? The Vietnam War going on too, you know, and oh. so for the U.S. that was a big deal, right? And, oh, here too. And, uh, yeah. and so yeah, I, I think that Romero has said this over and over again that his when he makes a zombie movie, he's really interested in the relationships of people. The zombies are kind of secondary, and, and that's actually true for The Walking Dead too. That that TV show that you that's mentioned, true. it's very much about the how people behave under extreme stress. So the zombies are just there to create the stress. They're not really the main character in Romero's movies. And so that's what he was interested in. He, he's, and, and again, like you said, it, it's the time that he made it, right? He wanted to make this movie and they really just wanted to make a B-war movie that they were gonna make their money back. So that was their first agenda. But of course, they're living in this time. So when they're coming up with their story, that kind of what is you know germinating in their heads. And when they're in the coffee shop talking to each other, that's what they're talking about. So it all gets put in there. And I mean, you know, another amazing thing was it had a black lead. Big big and I mean, this is the first, you know, feature movie to have a black lead. So that was, you know, right at the civil rights movement. And, yeah. and it was, you know, it was a huge thing. And he says, Romero says, in looking back, that he didn't intend to do that. And it wasn't, a, you know, he, they didn't plan to make a statement. And that that um, the lead in the movie was just their, a friend of theirs who happened to be the best actor. And when they wrote it, you know, they didn't write it. It was a, a truck driver, so they didn't write it with a, a, a race in mind. And it just, he was the best actor, so they cast him. But again, 
you know, most scholars would say, well, the, the time he was living in, and they wanted to sort of, you know, uh, get some attention. So, actually, you know what? And, and it holds up to today. Um, there's something universal about being afraid. It's one of those emotions that binds humanity together, believe it or not. And so often on this show, I say, you know, it'll be a funny thing if it's ghosts and horror stories, because every culture has them, every society has them, that finally unites the world as one and gets us to stop shooting each other. Could you speak a little bit about that? The, you know, the different cultures from around the world? Yeah, well, totally. Well, first of all, there are, if you, the modern zombie, as we understand it in, in, in movies, you know, that we see today and the movies starting from, from George Romero are fundamentally different than other zombie traditions around the world. But I totally agree with you uh, in terms of you're asking why zombie movies are so popular and why maybe horror movies are popular in general, but specifically zombies. We are living in a time of turmoil, right? It feels like it. we see these disasters on the news every day. We, you know, we're worried about the global economy. We're worried about global warming and, and the next great disaster and terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the stuff that we see on the news every day, these disasters either in our backyard or across the planet, uh, they look kind of similar to a zombie outbreak, right? The devastation, the desperation. So I think that zombies really play in that field of apocalypse. Like, you know, you see one zombie, then you see 10 zombies, then you see 10,000 zombies, then it's the end of the world. So if we're in a time where we're really worried about these global disasters, Zombies make a lot of sense. Folks, our guest tonight, Matt Moak, uh, his book is called Everything You Wanted to Know About Zombies. Uh, his, another book that he's got out is That's Not Your Mommy Anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. www.nightfrightshow.com. Tonight's our Halloween show, folks. Just joining us. Settle in. Get the coffee going. Get the tea going. Uh, get a hot chocolate going or whatever type of beverage that... Uh, your digestive system can handle tonight because <laughs> we're talking about zombies you're going to have to digest this afterwards if you're driving in the car across a trans canada or across a country ease off the gas pedal folks we're going to take you on a great ride tonight for halloween happy halloween let's go back to matt and talk about zombies now everybody's got a favorite zombie movie a zombie story where did the idea for this book that's not your mommy anymore where does that come from it in, in from between your ears. <laughs> well, you know, you, I mean, you may or may not know, but May May is zombie awareness um, every year. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the head of the Zombie Research Society, and so what we try to do is uh, promote zombie awareness and zombie scholarship, and we do that year round. But particularly in May, we kind of try to do a big event. So, one of the things we were talking about last May was um, trying to get kids more aware of the coming zombie plague. So that's where the idea of that's not your mommy came up. It was it's really intended to be a cautionary tale to teach kids how to recognize a zombie outbreak at its earliest stage. So, you know, the the mom turns into a zombie and chases the kid around the house and the kid then, you know, learns his lessons and he gets away and survives with all his friends. Um, it's really it's really Night of the Living Dead meets Dr. Seuss kind of. Thing. But, you know, it's all in good fun. <laughs> if it if just one kid, you know, survive. And I've done my job. Yeah, yeah. So it's really it's a public service uh, book that you're that you've put out there. That's the idea. Now, do you have kids yourself? I don't. No. Nope. Do you don't, do you go over and read perhaps to your nieces, your nephews from this I do, book? Yeah, I've got some nieces and nephews, and it's funny the reaction. I mean, I, um, how do they react? Well, you know, some kids. Well, first of all, I have a six-year-old niece who her favorite game is Left 4 Dead video games. So I mean, she's out. She's playing gory stuff that I don't even want to play. So. So, you know, some kids get scared and some kids think it's hilarious that this idea that their mom would turn into a zombie and they, you know, chase the mom around the house. So it's definitely, it, it's, you know, it's illustrated very much like a children's book and, and the rhyming is very much like a children's book. So it's not really gory or scary. The other thing is it tips its hat to a lot of classic zombies. So Romero is actually in it a little, you know, and uh, there's little hints throughout on every page of like classic, you know, Return of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and things like that. So, you know, it's it's sort of all in good fun. It's for kids that, you know, you see these little kids out at zombie walks and things like that with their parents. Probably more for those kind of kids. You know, like kids that kind of like it already and they just get a kick out of it. <laughs> you know, there's that whole um, 
comedic aspect of it as well. You know, I was watching old black and white movies of uh, zombies, not only George Romero's, but going back before that, more from the voodoo aspects, which you had uh, alluded to before. And there was still that interweaving, if you will, throughout the narrative of, of humor. There was some humor in there, some poignant humor moments. Yeah, yeah, and I think that... Um Again, I think that it's because zombies are so, first of all, they're us. I mean, this notion that, you know, I could turn into a zombie or my wife or my neighbor, it's kind of so terrifying. And this idea that they're the end of the world, it's not just like a vampire that secretly attends your high school and tries to steal your girlfriend, right? If zombies are around, that's it, you know, game over. So I think it's so terrifying that, that you almost do need to infuse some humor here and there. Um, and, you know, Romero does it, pretty much everybody does it. Um, because it just it gets just really hardcore um, when you get really into the nitty gritty of what it's all about. A couple of years ago, Romero released a new uh, zombie movie. I can't remember the name of it. Forgive me. The idea was though that they were on an island. Of course, you're secluded, which is always a great scenario for horror isolation. And there were zombies everywhere, of course, and they were looking for a cure to cure the zombies to bring them back to being human, if you will. Do you think, I, I, you know, as with vampires, the story has to change. Um, do you think we're going to see a day when we're going to have a zombie out there dating people in high school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, well, first of all, there are already movies out there like this. Um, there is, so, you know, that happens um, in some movies. There's a movie called Boy Eats Girl where a boy turns into a zombie and comes back and dates the girl and then he has to break the curse and things like that. So, you know, all sorts of movies. But um, I think that uh, the, in zombie circles, the common saying is, you know, the cure for being a zombie is to be dead, right? I mean, you're supposed to be dead, so there's really no cure other than to make you stop moving around. You know? But I do think that there is real potential if you think about the incubation period of the zombie sickness. So if I get bitten by a zombie, um, it may not be that I get sick in 15 minutes and, and die and turn into a zombie. That incubation period could be day, hours or days or weeks or even months, right? So there is a potential to find some sort of cure in there where you never move to the next stage. So I'm infected with zombieism, but I never die. I sort of, you know, I stay alive and maybe I stay healthy and I'm, I never become a zombie, you know? So it's, it's sort of a, you know, a treatment, not a... Not a, okay, fair enough. Folks, our guest tonight, Matt Moak. This is our Halloween show. Happy Halloween to everybody. Hope you're having fun and joining us tonight. Uh, we're talking about zombies, if you're just joining us, of all things. Uh, having a blast doing it. None better than that Matt Moak, who's our guest tonight. He's got two books out, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies. Yee! And That's Not Your Mommy Anymore. That is a classic, I'm sure. That should be made into a movie without, without question. Now... What did you want to know about zombies? And why did you write the book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Zombies? Well, I got into, I've always been obsessed with zombies and zombie movies. And, and, and like you said, that's, I kind of came to it from the movie side and studied them uh, in school. Um, but the thing is, I was, I was never as scared watching any zombie movie as I thought I would be in a real zombie outbreak. So my imagination of a zombie outbreak was always terrifying. And I'd see the movies and I enjoyed them, but I wasn't really terrified. I always felt like they weren't really giving me the whole story about what it would really be like. So that, that's kind of where it started for me. And that's why I started Zombie Research Society. I just said, okay, if a zombie were to show up at your front door, what would it look like? What would it sound like? How would it hunt you? How would its brain work? Everything you could think of from a hard scientific point of view. And that's kind of, that was the beginnings of the book, right? So. You know, Zombie Research Society has grown. Our advisory board as the head of Harvard Medical School. We've got PhD neuroscientists across the country and, and uh, leading experts in all these different fields that are really, we're having fun with it, but really serious about you know, studying zombie science and figuring out, you know, how to survive this coming place. So that's kind of all the stuff is in the book. Do zombies suffer the same societal elements and uh, tragedies that we do? <laughs> all right, do they get peer pressured into eating someone and things like that? <laughs> um, you know, all prevailing theories are no, right? <laughs> uh, that zombies, 
really interesting aspect of zombies is they do what they do and you cannot get them not to do it, right? They are relentlessly aggressive in their one pursuit. So they don't, they will even, uh, they, they want to eat living people, right? So they will even do that at their own risk of harm. So they don't care if they could get their arm chopped off or they could break their ankle or whatever happens to them, it doesn't matter. As long as they can keep moving towards that singular goal, you know? So it seems like from all prevailing theories that there isn't any peer pressure and they pretty much do what they do. They just do what they do. Folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. It's going to take you right to a spot, folks, where you can order this book from the comfort of your own home. Get the book. It's great for a good laugh. It'll get you thinking also about your own idiosyncrasies, perhaps society's idiosyncrasies. And, you know, if you can laugh about them, hey, you're halfway there, right? Uh, our guest tonight, Matt Moak, he's the leading global authority in all things zombie. As founder and head of the Zombies Research Society, ZRS, ZRS, he has been directly involved in most major advances in zombie scholarship over the past decade. Everything you ever wanted to know about zombies, and Matt, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, we have them here in Canada. There's a whole bunch of them in Ottawa. We just call them politicians. Uh, the other book, <laughs> that's not your mommy anymore. Now, how did your background, uh, you know, you've explained why you got into zombies and the horror genre. What made you go into film and actually study the genre? Because it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Most, most yeah, uh, you know, I think it was just the interest level. I, I don't know. I, I was in, uh, in college and I, I found out about this opportunity at NYU in grad school and, and went there and interviewed and, and it just sort of all fell in place. I never, I have to say growing up, I never really thought that I could actually really study zombies um, and, and become a zombie expert. I mean, you know, now it's my full-time job, which for me is, I'm as surprised as anybody, you know, go around and give college lectures about zombies. It's just, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's surprising. Hey, man. That's great. Yeah, whatever works. Well, right? well, no, it's not that. It's because, you know, we're laughing about it. We're making a little bit of a, a joke about it. But really, there's a seriousness behind it because it, it asks us to hold a mirror up to ourselves is what it's doing. And how, not only ourselves, but how we treat other people in society right. as well. Yeah. And, and you know, one thing I think is great in terms of survival aspect is if you get really serious about zombie survival, um, you find that it's really, it's not, oh, I'm gonna grab a shotgun and blow off a bunch of zombie heads. It really is, the truth really is that the things you need to do to survive a zombie outbreak are essentially the exact same things you need to do to survive a giant earthquake in Los Angeles or you know some major natural disaster in any big city or a terrorist attack or the aftermath of great uh, disasters looks almost exactly like the aftermath of a zombie outbreak so you know you need to worry about food water and shelter and security and all of these basic basic human needs so that's a great thing in terms of teaching zombie survival it really helps people get more prepared for whatever they may face and uh, you know, continue as an extension to that. We're flipped to a little bit more serious now. What are some of the things that um, you've come up in your research about zombies, quote unquote, that you were unaware of in terms of how we go about in our own society treating, uh, say, uh, immigrants? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the really, I'll sort of take it from the film angle. I think that that's the other really interesting thing about zombies is because they are sort of this blank canvas The you know zombies like i said they don't really have a lot of personality they don't have a lot of opinions they have a singular focus like what you find in movies is that you can make the zombie symbolize whatever you want right i mean they can, you could sort of address whatever problem there was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called zombies of mass destruction and it was really playing on this that it was in the george bush era and it was playing on this notion that the, the immigrants and the zombies were sort of kind of the same thing and people were treating them the same way and you know distrustful of them and all this thing this whole angle with it and it you know it was interesting in that way but I but you know you see it every zombie movie has its own little take on what, what the zombie means and you can really um, play with it however you want what scares you Matt <laughs> I, I gotta say uh, zombies scare me but, but they really do I, I you know I, I I don't like to go to zombie walks and sort of don't like to be around where people are dressed up like zombies, to tell you the truth. But um, what really scares me in all this research is how many diseases out there are mutating in such, such strange ways 
that really are starting to mimic what we think of as uh, zombies or you know, zombies. And, and a great example of that is uh, mad cow disease. So mad cow disease in people is called Kruxfeldt Jakob disease. And this, it's caused by a mutated protein. And this protein, if, you, if, if you're subjected to it in the proper way, it's 100% fatal and 100% communicable, right? So you, if, you, if you are uh, exposed to it, you will get this disease and you will die. There is no cure, right? This, this protein has been around since the beginning of time. Like the beginning of man, but we've really only heard about mad cow disease in the past decade or so, right? And that's because what's happening is the protein is, its symptoms are changing. So, so much so that now it seems like it's, it's uh, making people go insane. Before you die, you go insane. And often you go violently insane. And there are new indications that it can be transferred from blood to blood. Meaning that if I get this disease, I go violently insane, I turn around, attack you, and bite you, then you get the disease and you go violently insane. And, and the problem with that is that that's exactly the premise of Zombieland, the 2009 you know, hit zombie movie. That's exactly the premise of Zombieland. So this isn't something I'm making up. This isn't you know, science fiction. I mean, this is coming from you know, serious scholars who don't know anything about zombies and aren't interested in zombies. They're interested in trying to learn about this disease. And you know, so it, it's kind of freaky to me when you start looking at real science and it starts mimicking what we think of as these fantasy zombies. Now. Yeah, that would that would freak me out too. Actually, you've just creeped me out. Congratulations, <laughs> folks. We're talking about. Let me say one more thing about that: is that an expert from the Mad Cow Institute in England has actually recommended that if people start showing advanced signs of this new form of mad cow, that you should lock them in a room and let them go violently insane until they die, because of this risk that they might attack and bite you, and you will then get get it also. So I mean, there we go. Like we're there. Wow, we really are. Um, I want to go back and look at the voodoo aspects of things and, uh, you know, the history of zombieism, if you will, and the reality of voodoo. Um, and Haiti, of course. Uh, Haiti's all over the news these days also. Uh, folks, I just want to tell you, we're celebrating Halloween tonight. If you're just joining us, settle in, relax, get comfy, get the coffee going, tea going, uh, hot chocolate going. If you're, on your, if you're in your car, ease off the gas pedal. We're going to take you on a journey tonight, a great journey about zombies. None better than Matt Moak, who's joining us tonight. He's got two books out, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies, and That's Not Your Mommy Anymore. Yeah, imagine that waking up and your mom's a zombie. <laughs> Scary scenario. <laughs> www.nightfrightshow.com. www.nightfrightshow. Most important thing there, folks, are the archives. They're all there for you to download free. Stick them on your iPods if you're off to school. Uh, stick them on your iPods if you're going across the country. Truckers, I know you all love this stuff. You put it on and you listen to it. That's great. Thank you so much. And keep the emails coming. Nightfrightshow at gmail.com. Um, www.nightfrightshow.com, folks. Just click on that book cover associated with tonight's guest. That'll take you right to a place. You can get this book online. Just order it. It's readily available. Should be there 24, 48 hours. It'll be there. No problem at all, folks. Let's go back to Matt and uh, talk some more about um, zombies. And, you know, you, you really did creep me out when you told me that, that they would just lock them away and that's it and you're done. Uh, I, I got some more. Please, please, Kate, let's go along this line a little bit more. There's a, a virologist at the University of Miami who was, who was interviewed... Um, about a year ago on this project that I was working on. And again, she doesn't know anything about zombies. She's not interested in zombies. Um, but she was asked. They sort of told her the symptoms of zombieism and how this might work. And she was asked if this is even possible. And she said that we could create a zombie sickness in the lab today. That it would be actually much more simple to do that than it would be to um, clone sheep or clone people, which is things that we can do, right? She said, all you would need to do is combine a highly deadly strain of the flu with a highly deadly strain of rabies, and then you mix in a couple other viruses in there for good measure, and you create this new super virus that is airborne and goes across the planet, turns us all into raving maniacs that attack each other. So, and she said, you know, we can completely do that. It, all you need is, you know, if someone had the money and they had the know-how and they had the time, they just get in the lab and do it. So. You know, again, this isn't some kook living in a basement. This is a you know a, a well-respected professor at the University of Miami in Florida. 
who was like, yeah, no problem. And it would be airborne. And of course, you know, as with anthrax, when the, the scare came in a few years ago, well, 10 years ago, just after 9-11, uh, everybody was concerned about that because of our, our society now travels through airplanes in a closed environment. And uh, that was terrifying at the time. And this sounds much along those same lines. It truly is terrifying. Um, how do you kill a zombie? <laughs> well, again, I, I really try to, in zombie research society, we don't make anything up. So, right, we don't say that there was a zombie outbreak uh, last week in, uh, you know, Ontario, right? We, we know that didn't happen. So, so this is all theory, but the prevailing theory is that you, the way you destroy, kill a zombie is you shoot in the head or destroy the brain, you destroy the head because it's, it's undead, meaning that the heart is no longer just driving the body like, like a living human. So the brain is the driver of the body. Um, so you destroy the brain, you know, whatever else is going on, whatever else systems are working in the body, if you destroy the head, you destroy the brain, it's not going to be doing it. Okay, that's what you do. I was going to ask you, do zombies drive? But, I, you know, I, I was born in Montreal, and I can attest to the fact that they do. Um, <laughs> do they have... Do zombies have families? Do they uh, produce offspring, if you will, other than by eating them? Right. Again, all you know, all prevailing theories is no. I mean, and actually, the 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 systems to actually procreate and, and breed are really, really complex. So, if you think of a zombie as actually a rotting corpse, I mean, they don't live forever, right? So they they are actually slowly rotting back into the earth, and their goal is to. Uh, get to you or, or infect as many people as they can before they rot back in the earth. So, so this notion that they could uh, breed is probably a stretch, but there are some movies where zombies breed, right? So it can't be funny movies. And Peter Jackson you know, won one uh, Best Picture Oscar for, Best Director Oscar for Lord of the Rings. His first movie was a, a zombie movie called, it's called Dead Alive. And from the early 90s, I think, yeah, it must be early 90s, it's called Dead Alive, and actually the original title in New Zealand is called Brain Dead. But when it came, to the, came, came over to North America, they renamed it Dead Alive. You might find it on a movie. But in that, it's a, it's a romp, it's a big, funny movie, and very sort of gross and all over the place. It's about a son whose mom turns into a zombie, and the mom's very overbearing, so he sort of tries to protect the mom and hide her in the basement. Meanwhile, she keeps eating people every time they come over. But there's a guy that turns into a zombie there, and a nurse, and they fall in love, and they have a zombie baby. So, that, you know, it does happen. It does happen. And, you know, we're talking about the films right now, and uh, again, how they've changed since those days uh, of Night of the Living Dead up to, um, geez, what's the name of the movie, 28 Days Later. I mean, the, I'm used to zombies walking very slow, and kind of Frankenstein-like, and you just whack them in the head, and they really can't, they don't do much, but now... With 28 days later, man, <laughs> the faster than the speeding light. Uh, so there really is a new element that you cannot protect yourself. And I'm wondering if that is the message that's been there all along, the loss of control, that there is very little hope for you, um, and that you are in deadly danger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the... the uh... The fast zombie, the new trend in fast zombies, that was kind of, and with 28 Days Later, just like you said, was kind of the biggest chance in, in popular zombie culture in 40 years. I mean, zombies had more or less been the same since Romero invented them in 1968, exactly. The, and then, you know, we come along with these fast zombies, and now in 28 Days Later, it was a rage infection. So technically the zombies, they didn't die and come back to life so that's kind of how they could explain it look these are just people infected with this rage sickness that makes them kind of act like zombies but they can still run because they're alive but then we had the dawn of the dead remake that came out a couple years after that 2004 and they they were dead they were just like romero zombies they died and came back but they ran around anyway um so at that point it was basically like running zombies are here instead you know but um yeah, you know, I, 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 traditionalists don't love the running zombies, but I do think that there's they're, they're kind of here to stay. I mean, Zombieland in 2009, they were running around, right? So I think at least in film, there are going to be a lot of running zombies. You know, I don't mind that so much. What what really annoys me is how vampires have changed. I, 
guess I grew up on the you know the old Peter um, uh, what's his face there uh, Cushing uh, you know vampires they scared the hell out of me and now there's these romantic creatures that kiss and love and yeah come on for God's sake scare me <laughs> if I want to read a romance novel I'll go read a romance novel and I hope you know um, that was one of my concerns with the AMC show that they were going to somehow adopt uh, this uh, narrative that seems to be very popular now, and I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they scare the hell out of me still, because I want to be scared. Right, right. And, you know, for zombie purists, they use the slow zombie, which everybody was really happy about, right? Because there was the big question whether or not they were going to use the slow zombie or the fast zombie. But, you know, what you just said about, about this feeling of impending doom, and that's why zombies are scary, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, who you know, never made a zombie movie, which I wish he did, but he, he said... There is no fear in the bang, only in the gun. Meaning, when the gun goes off, there's no more fear. That's sort of the climax of it. But the real fear, and what he was interested in when he made that movie, in his movies, is that period before. You know, you know it's going to happen. You know it's coming. But you're still alive, and you're sort of still there, and you're stressed out about it. And that's really what zombies are, right? I mean, we can, especially the slow ones, we can get away from them. We can hide in a farmhouse. We can get some safe place. But eventually, they're just coming, and they're coming, and they're coming. And that's really, you know, according to Hitchcock, right, which I was, you know, I tend to agree with, that's really the scary thing. Oh, my gosh. I know somehow deep down, I know they're going to get me, even though maybe I'm, I'm safe for a minute. It scares me as well. Folks, we're talking about a great book tonight, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies. And our guest is Matt Moak. He is the leading global authority on all things zombie. Uh, he's also head of the Zombie Research Society, which I'm going to talk to him about in a second. Uh, that's not your mommy anymore. That's another book he has out, www.nightfrightshow. Happy Halloween, folks. Uh, nightfrightshow.com, by the way. Just click on the book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can buy this book from the comfort of your own home. And I recommend it. You're going to have a good laugh. And also, you're going to learn a lot about zombies, and I suspect horror films as well. Matt, you, I suspect a lot of people that make horror films, books, uh, and it's plethora of this genre, it's just an expanding genre, they must come to the Zombie Research Society um, just to try and ask you, I, I guess, of uh, what the actual criteria is to keep it in the zombie realm. Yeah, we do do uh, we do do film uh, consulting and consult on script and things like that. So that's definitely a side of it. Um, I have to say, uh, my feeling is though that um, when you're making art, you know, if someone's making a movie, they don't, they sort of they should be free to do it however they want. I mean, if you want to have zombies fall in love and you know go off and raise a family, great. You know, maybe there's something there, and maybe something that you do will get picked up in the general zombie culture. I mean, there's, there are certain things we can say about zombies or, or, you know, you may ask five people walking down the street, they don't know that much about zombies, but you ask them what zombies eat, and most people will say brains, right? Everybody thinks zombies eat brains. Now, that is only from the Return of the Living Dead film series, which is a series from the mid 80s to like the early 90s, essentially three movies, but only three zombie movies that were any zombies ever ate brains. But for some reason, and that one thing in that movie got picked up across culture. And even though it's not in any Romero movies, it's not in 28 Days Later, it's not in Dawn of the Dead, Zombieland, none of, nobody eats brains. But we all feel like, oh yeah, zombies eat brains. So you never know. Go try some of the new zombies and maybe it'll get picked up. Are there guys just cashing in on it uh, when they make a movie? Yeah. And what are the movies that piss you off? Well, you know, the thing about it is that the movies actually, movies gen even, you know, I've, I've often said, and this is one of the reasons a lot of zombie movies get made, is that it's pretty cheap to make a zombie movie relatively. Because all you need is a bucket of fake blood and five friends who are willing to limp around, right? You dump some blood on them, you make them limp around your backyard, and all of a sudden you got a zombie movie, right? Oh my gosh, you know, the zombies ate my dog, or whatever, you know. Um, but movies in general are really expensive. So... For the most part, people that get into making zombie movies, um, they either know they're going to be half decent so they'll make money, or they're doing it because they love it so much. I think where you see the real trying to cash in is in zombie books. Um, you know, coming from me, a guy's got two zombie books out, but but I, there, there are a lot of zombie books out there that um, aren't so great and are really written by people who literally are just trying to cash in. and. Um, 
Uh, there, there's actually a part in my book about that, and I, I actually have changed my opinion about this over the years. I used to think I love zombie stuff. Any zombie book's great. I'll read it all, and you know, just like movies, there are good ones and bad ones, and I don't care. I want to read them all, and you know, hey, who cares what the author was intending to do? But I kind of changed my tune. I've talked to you know Max Brooks, who's the uh, wrote World War Z, which is be made into a movie with Brad Pitt, and um, Zombie Survival Guide, which has you know been a bestseller for years and years and years. Um, great, he's a really great guy, and he's a good friend of mine. And he kind of had the other opinion, right? A lot of people are doing this for bad reasons. And there, there, there have been some. Um, there was an article in Writer Magazine, which is a busy estate, last October that that taught people how to make money off zombies. And basically, the, the magazine says, even if you don't like zombies at all, here's how you make money off them. So it, there's such a craze right now, and they're so popular that you put zombie in the title of your book, and you got a good shot at it. You know, um, so there is some stuff out there that's not. Yeah, it's kind of like the young adult market right now with uh, vampire stories. It's just flooded, uh, saturated. That's a better word for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Matt Mokes, our guest tonight, folks, if you're just joining us, settle in. we got a lot of time left. No problem at all. We're talking about zombies and happy Halloween. It's Halloween, folks. Settle in. Get comfy. Uh, we're celebrating Halloween tonight. We're talking about zombies. Yep. The light of the living dead and all things horror and... Uh, Get ready to get scared a little bit, too. We're talking about his new book, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies, and another book, That's Not Your Mommy Anymore, which I think is a great title for a book, a kid's book of all things. Easy to way to get both books, folks. Just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can order this book from the comfort of your own armchair, as I say. Matt, let's go back now. Um, was there something in writing this book? Uh, did the zombie evolve, in other words, uh, from your first book to your second book in your own mind? Was there something that uh, kind of said, you know, yeah, that defines a zombie much better than I, I did in the first book? Uh, not so much, but the thing that did strike me, I mean, yeah. that's not your mommy anymore, is all all in good fun, right? That one, it's it tended to be fun, and it's illustrated, and it's, you know, children's book, it's great. Um, everything you ever want to know about zombies, I was really trying to dig into it and say, okay, well, you know, like you said, what really are zombies, and what are they all about, and why are the questions that we're asking right now? Um, the one thing that did surprise me was that uh, when I looked up the definition of zombie in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, it only gave the definition of the voodoo zombie. It said a, a slave-like uh, creature, you know, a corpse that's been risen from the dead to work in fields under the direction of a, of a mystic person. Now that has that is completely different than the zombie that we see in movies, yeah. right? That's, that's a great segue, segue, by the way, Matt, because I wanted to talk about that as well. Because one of the movies I watched in research, you're going to laugh, I watched a bunch of movies, zombie movies for research, but there was one about Cambodian zombies that goes back, I think, 38, 1938, black and white. Um, the French were still in there, of course, in Vietnam, because that's uh, Southeast Asia and Cambodia. And, and as, as you say, um, they had become zombie warriors they had started off working in in as slaves in the in the fields and then all of a sudden they become warriors for the french and uh they send them over to world war one geez i guess maybe the movie may go back even further than 38 might be 28. there's sound so I, i'm not quite i'll have to double check it but uh i just thought the whole thing was so fascinating it's such an early age here's a zombie movie and now, can we look at the origins of, of the whole Haitian, how, you know, zombies were first, and they were real. Um, there was a certain drug that they would ingest, and then they would wake yeah. up. And Can we talk all about that? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and, and this is in the book also, but it's fun to talk about. Um, the the uh, zombies, and they're, you know, they're actually still in Haiti today. There are, still, there are still people in Haiti today who believe they're zombies and are being treated like zombies. Um, they're given a, a first of all, it's a, it's a process of a religious ritual. So what happens is they are made to believe that they died and came back to life. Now, this is fundamentally different than being undead, right? Their heart's still beating, and they still need to eat, and they need to sleep. 
but they, they what they think they've been brought back to life, not undead. Sort of, they're alive again, but their soul has been taken by the person that brought them back to life. So I'm a sorcerer. I bring you back to life, and I say, "Hey, I got your soul in my hand. So now you have to do whatever I say." So then I use you as labor, and you, know, he, it's, you sleep in a pen. You know, you're basically treated like an animal, um, and I use you to work in the fields, or I rent you out to other people. It's you know menial labor. Um, and that's, that's what a zombie was way back when, when the first you know, um, colonists went into Haiti to, to, and found out about this, and that's kind of how it got into the movies. Um, and that's still what in Haiti, that's still what zombies are. You know? Wow. Isn't that fascinating, you know? And uh, to think it, it came from part of a religious... Um, are zombies religious? There's a question. Yeah, I mean, well, that, are they themselves religious? Yeah. Um, I think the zombie, as it's conceived, you know, today in popular culture, I would say no. I mean, they're sort of nothing but a, they're sort of a walking empty shot. Um, fight. Yeah, they're 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 a personification of a of an infectious disease. So it's just a walking infectious disease that's trying to infect somebody else or eat someone else. Um, that's kind of as much personality as they have. You know what I mean? Um, but no, in terms of the Haitian. Um, cultural background for sure you know highly religious ceremony and then you know you mentioned the drug the way they keep these people from eventually saying not saying well wait a minute i'm not a zombie you know i want to go back and live with my family they keep them on this drug which is called the zombie cucumber and it's essentially it's a it's a, it's a this drug that they give them addictive drug that keeps them kind of in this zonked out state where they're not really thinking clearly and they're a little blurry and then they kind of get addicted to it, so then they just want it all the time. And so you can just kind of keep them there, give them the drug, and they'll do whatever you want. So it's a, it's part belief and part drug, and you know, and uh, it's it's really interesting. Uh, but you know, they're not dangerous, and they don't eat people, and uh, you know, they don't want your brain. It's so. interesting though how that extension, uh, the personification of somebody stoned out on drugs becomes a zombie, and then we just extrapolate from that and create these right. this cultural. Um, Phenomena about it, folks. Right. I'm having a blast tonight. Not a bl not only a blast, but I'm learning a lot. And I really appreciate our guest tonight, Matt Moak, coming on the show. He's got two books out. Everything you always wanted to know about zombies, and I know there's a lot of you out there that are dying to know everything you always wanted to know about zombies. Great book to get if you do. Uh, that's not your mommy anymore. This is a great kids book. Um, you know, you want to read your kids something funny and and allow them to survive the coming zombie uh, plague and, and attacks, this is a great book for that. You know, it's a survival guide almost. Uh, easy way to get both books, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. Or just head down to your local uh, bookstore and uh, support them and buy the book. I mean, it's a great, fun thing to do. And again, as like I like to do with this show generally, is get people to think outside the box and look at society and everything that's going on from a different perspective, upside down and all around, as I like to say. Matt, um, in your bio here, it says that uh, you were involved. He received advanced combat and survival training in the French Foreign Legion, the mercenary wing of the French military. We gotta talk about that. I've never talked to somebody that was in the Foreign Legion before. Hello. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That was that was great. I mean, that was about uh, I got out about ten years ago, but um, it was uh, after grad school, and I'd worked in Hollywood for a couple years, and uh, I kind of got a little restless, a little disillusioned with the Hollywood scene, and I was like, look, I'm young enough, I can do something a little crazy, and um, and I had heard about the Legion from a friend of mine in graduate school who kind of knew a lot about it. And, and just from a roundabout way, I kind of forgot about it. And I was, I was uh, working in a literary management company and I was helping one of our clients fix her script. And the script had some Legion, French Foreign Legion in it. So I said, look, I know a little bit about the Legion. You go fix this other stuff with your script and I'll fix the Legion part because I kind of, you know, I, I had this background a little bit. And so I did more research and more research, and it was just right about that time that I was thinking, you know, I could do something crazy, and I kind of, you know, want to maybe go overseas, and it just was on the front of my head, so I was like, hey, I'm going to go do it. So flew over to France and uh, handed over my passport, and they, uh, you know, they give you a new name, they give you a new birth certificate, um, and, 
you know, they no one can take your picture. It's kind of all this, you know, pseudo secretive stuff. And then, you know, just uh, just went through the went went through my paces. It was interesting. I was the only native English speaker in my uh, in my company. So, you know, I I always have this romantic uh, vision, of course, from the movies of right. somebody in the French Foreign Legion. Um, how accurate is that portrayal? Probably. Well, I mean, there is some, I gotta say, I mean, there is some romance to it. It's interesting. I think that a lot of um, Westerners join for romantic reasons. So there, there were a lot of stories of like, you know, an Italian guy in my company who um, asked his girlfriend's father for her hand in marriage. And he said, oh, you'll never be man enough for my daughter, right? So he's sort of so distraught, he runs off and joins the Legion. So that sounds a lot like what you might hear from a movie, right? Or me, you know. I mean, looking back, I would say, oh, the spoiled American who's like, oh, my life's so tough, I'm going to go join the Legion, you know? I mean, it's like, give me a break. I didn't like my job, so I joined the French Foreign Legion. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of Easterners actually joined for real economic reasons because um, because if you're in the Legion for five years, you can get French citizenship. And then once you have French citizenship, you can work anywhere in the EU. So you'd have... Lithuanian carpenters and um, Russian guys in the Russian military who were very high ranking were like, well, forget it. I can't even really make a living. I haven't gotten paid for three months. I'm going to go join the French Legion. And as soon as I'm in for five years, I become a French citizen and then I'm all set. So, um, you know, I can sort of ply my trade in Spain wherever I want. Um, so, so there was a lot of that. It was a, it was a big divide. All the Westerners joined for these romantic reasons that you might see in movies, you know. Um, uh, and um, the Easterners joined for purely economic reasons. You know. Now, you know, I always think of Algeria. Now, Algeria is no longer a French colony, but were you placed in uh, some remote I, area? Well, no, the, the, the entire time, and there, there's, the Legion isn't in Algeria anymore, but yeah, you're right. It used to be the headquarters of the Legion, and now the headquarters of the Legion is actually right outside of Marseille. So, um, and the training company, or, you know, uh, the training, uh, unit for the Legion is sort of right outside of Toulouse, so on the, uh, the south southwest side of the of France. Um, so that's where I was the whole time. I was, I was for, for a portion of the time I was outside of Marseille and a portion of the time I was outside of Toulouse. Now you have an option to um, re-up for a, uh, another contract, and once you do that, then you are placed overseas. So they do have French Guiana in you know, South America, and they have um, uh, Africa and Djibouti in North Africa and uh, Tahiti actually is they have a little board in Tahiti which everybody wants to go to right and then um, a few other places but essentially uh, when you first start you're in France. Any regrets for joining? No not at all I mean it didn't know it, it was fantastic I, you know at the time I sure occasionally I was like oh this is so hard and da 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 but um, no it was great I mean met some great guys and it was just incredibly interesting Not you know, I didn't get hurt so that's a good thing. Um, but no, looking back... Are there right. tips you can give us? You know, you took combat training. Are there tips you can give us that we could um, uh, use in our own lives when the uh, the coming zombie plague comes? Yeah, well, I mean, the two things I would say, first and foremost, one is um, you should avoid combat at all costs. Um, L.V. Corby is this... Is this well-known security expert. He's been on Oprah and he's been all over, you know, the news for years and um, he's credited with having um, one of the safest houses on the planet. He built this house that is just, you know, impenetrable and he's, he knows everything about security. And um, he says, which I, I really agree with, that, that when, fit, when a situation reduces to violence, um, there is no winner. There are, only, there are only varying degrees of loss, right? And what that means is, so if there's a zombie, you take that in a zombie plague, there's a zombie in front of me, and I said, okay, I'm going to kill this zombie. It, if, if you have an option to get away, you should, because let's say, okay, I'm going to kill this zombie. You take your weapon, you kill the zombie. First of all, in that encounter, a lot could happen. Secondly, you're potentially drawing attention to yourself. You're wasting time. You're wasting energy. You're wasting limited resources that you have to kill the zombie when you could have gotten away. So first thing I'll say is get away. Like avoid combat like your life depends on it, because it probably does. Secondly, I would say, there's a lot that we don't know about what zombies are going to be like when they come, right? Are they going to be slow? Are they going to be fast? How smart are they going to be? Can they open door knobs? We don't know a lot of stuff. But the one thing we do know is that people make zombies. 
right? With like without any people, there can be no zombies. If I'm in a room all by myself, that's completely secure, and I'm the only one there, only two things can happen, right? Either I'm going to turn into a zombie, or, like die and turn into a zombie, or I will never see a zombie because I'm the only one there. So I would say stay away from people, avoid contact, and stay away from people. Whatever your zombie survival plan is, if it involves going to a place where there are a lot of other people, do not do it. Don't do it. Fair enough. I think that's great advice. Um, how are you planning to survive? Are you going to stay there where you are now, or are you going to dig a hole in the ground and just... Yeah, well, I think, you know, I live in Los Angeles, and um, the traffic is so bad in L.A. on a regular day that, you know, if dead are walking around, no one's going to be able to get out of town. So, and that's true in pretty much any city. I mean, if you, if you live in any city of any decent-sized population... The traffic jams are going to be so bad that it, it, you shouldn't feel like, oh, when the zombies come, I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive to some safe, remote location. It's just not going to happen. You're going to be stuck in that town. So I think all zombie survival is local. And wherever you are when you know the zombies come is where you probably have to try to survive. So my plan involves you know surviving in Los Angeles and surviving in my house and, and trying to make the best of it. Now, Again, going back to that stay away from people notion, if you are caught outside in, in your own city or in an unfamiliar city in a zombie outbreak, you want to go to a cemetery because cemeteries have the lowest population density of any in any city, right? So if you look at a city and you look at it as a grid, the least amount of people are in a cemetery. People don't think to go to cemeteries. So we all see zombies running down the street and everyone goes, oh, I'm going to go to the police station. I'm going to go to the Walmart and get supplies, I'm going to go here and there. No one will go to the cemetery, right? But the thing is, zombies don't rise from graves. So this notion of a zombie rising from a grave in a cemetery and ch chasing you down is, is completely unfounded because zombies don't possess any greater physical ability than they did in the body of the human, right? So if you were buried yourself under six feet of dirt in a coffin, would you be able to get out? No, no way. So even if the bodies in the cemetery turn into zombies, there's no way they're getting it. It's like Michael Jackson video, thriller video notes of like hands clawing out of the ground, you know. There's no way that's going to happen. So you go to the cemetery, absolutely nobody's there. Nobody will think to go there. So there's no other people to turn into zombies, and there are also no other zombies there because zombies go where people go, right? So Food source. Folks, when you turn into Night Fright, you get the best advice. Now you know how to survive a zombie attack. Can I tell you? None better tonight, folks. Matt Moak was our guest. His book is called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Zombies. And the other book is That's Not Your Mommy Anymore. <laughs> Two great books for you to survive the coming plague, folks. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a place where you can order this book online. Matt, I want to thank you so much. I know you're off to New York early tomorrow. Uh, so I want to thank you for coming on the show and being a super trooper. It's been really a, a great time. Uh, I've really enjoyed our talk tonight, uh, the serious moments as well as the, uh, the ones that are giving me a lot of fun. Great way to spend Halloween. Thank you for spending your Halloween with us. That's terrific. Yeah, it was a great time. I really appreciate you having me. And, uh, you know, stay safe. The, the Zombie Research Society motto is, what you don't know can eat you. So do your research and stay safe. Is there any secret handshake or anything? or? No, we try not to keep anything secret. Now we want to... Okay, so you're not the Illuminati then. Okay, that's good to know. Maybe they're the zombies. Who knows? Folks, I'm Brian Hall from Night Fright. Thank you all and a happy Halloween to one and all. Stay safe with the kids out there, folks, when you're having fun. I'm Brian Holland from Night Fright. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha